liquid food, the Amiga 1000 originally, it's the only Amiga that does this, is it takes two disks to get into what's called Workbench. Workbench is basically the desktop environment that you'd be used to if you were to launch Windows or Mac OS X, something like that. Um, the first thing you would launch, which we talked a little bit about earlier, is the Kickstarter. It's really mostly like firmware, setting up all of your little peripherals and, and getting the machine ready to go. Once it launches, or once it loads the Kickstarter, it'll then say, oh, insert your workbench disk, which, uh, I swear, these are all legal copies. It's kind of crazy that I have to say that in 2018, but there's still actually a copyright owner of this software, um, which drives me crazy to no end. But regardless, what you're about to see in this room, some of it's in mm -hmm. um, But that's why it's not being sold on the market. Uh, some people just gave it to me that actually created it themselves. So, the idea being, when I get to the workbench screen, uh, this is where you would then decide as a, as a user of the machine. I mean, they're going to put in my workbench screen. Or, a lot of games or software at the time would want to be inserted at this time and take over the machine entirely. They would sometimes come with a little bit of workbench on the disk themselves, because that was, that was totally legal. You were allowed to do that uh, as, a, as a software creator. You just weren't allowed to do some of this other mumbo jumbo or sell any of that uh, workbench standalone. But basically, you would put your disk in, and you would either load the game, or you put your workbench disk in, and get in there to do some work, like whatever it is you needed to do with the machine. So, basically, some guys came up with this idea. This was 1987, out of New York. A man named Mr. Lowe, who was still alive. I've actually been, I, I totally geek out on the history on this stuff, and I actually try and find out information on who these people were. Um, he had created in 1987 a totally legal and sold uh, in multiple ways a software that would allow you, I'll show you how this works, it would allow you to load the Kickstart and Workbench 1.3, slightly turned down, all off of a single disk, and it was completely legal. Mm. Um, I'm going to keep saying that. I paid for it. He still charged me for it. I couldn't believe it. He didn't just give it to me. Uh, I was like, really? It's $30. Uh, she heard me. Uh, but here it is, in all of its glory. And it takes a little while. There, it just loaded Kickstart. Mm. And now it's moving on to Workbench. It never asked me for that second disc. It's all on one. The crazy thing is, if you actually want to do this yourself, you absolutely still can. What it does, it'll send you a file in an email that you have to get onto a disk that first you load your Kickstarter like you always used to do, and it holds it in the memory. And then you put his kick work into the machine. It takes your kick work, because it's yours, writes it to the floppy of kick work, and that's how he stays legal with it, because it's your copy of kick work. It puts it all onto one floppy, and here she goes grinding. You can ignore that date. It thinks it's 1988 <laughs> at about 8 p.m. Uh, yeah. And there it is. Oh. Now it's done. Now, what's crazy about this, he got to have a little fun with it. It actually says Amigo, which was the name of the company. Not Amigo, all right? Amigo Kickwork 1.3. It shows me my RAM, which is, this is, this is a, it says two and a half. Because this little guy right here is actually two megs attached to the side. This is my favorite little side. This is my favorite expansion they ever made back in the day for the Amiga. Why? Because it's the same color and it's the same shape, same border radius on all of the stuff. It totally matches the machine and it actually has a lot of amazing capabilities besides just being RAM. It has a clock inside it, which I'll get to in a minute, and it also has. You could either get what they called the, they were such nerds, I love it, they were all into Star Trek. <laughs> they had the Star Drive. Star Drive, which you have a hard drive to And the clock was the Star Clock. Because <laughs> we're going to go get our, our time from the Star. Um, but it's the Star Board, right? Star, Star, Star. <laughs> or you could get something called the Multifunction mo uh, Module. Right? Which mm -hmm. did all these other little funky things. It would put things into, uh, into your RAM disk and hold on to them on a reboot. and Stuff I would never use. I bought this off of eBay because I wanted the two megs of RAM. I plugged it in. I was like, oh my god, 
God, it's got the star drive. I'm such a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and I can totally figure this out. Um, and that'll be part of this too. But anyway, so I'm going to turn this off. Now, that is the legal guy. Yeah. <coughs> then there was this, and I've talked to this gentleman as well, uh, a man named Andre Pfeiffer. He goes by uh, a handle on multiple uh, Amiga forums, which are still vibrant, uh, a rat. Hmm. You might see him if you happen to uh, go to a1k.org or some other places like this. A uh, very, very intelligent uh, engineer who, in 2008, came up with this really wacky version called Twin Kick. Hmm. Twin Kick, not only, uh, all of his do the, the kick work stuff already. That's like, yeah, whatever even though that was like mind-blowing for the first time I ever saw it. But what his do is they do that, and then they always go a step further. Um, twin kick allows you to decide fairly soon if you want to boot into 1.3, the native operating system for this machine, or 3.1, wow. right? And so you get to this crazy screen eventually uh, of this really awesome, please be working. Yeah, it's, okay, so he did a little bit of weird stuff here too, and he told me oh, that was all intentional, it was supposed to look like a demo senior kind of thing, where we always <laughs> kind of played with the screen, I'm like, you could have played with it more than that, but you get this, like, amazing image of an Amiga 1000, and you get to choose, do you want 1.3, or do you want 3.1, and if you don't do anything, it's going to assume you want modern, modernity of 3.1, which you don't. I actually like to live in ancient times, uh. um, but that's what it'll be, that's actually what it's trying to do right now. Is it will get to the point where it's going to say, it's going to be this screen right here with the little disc that everyone uh, that uses more modern Amigas would be used to seeing with the check mark and the floppy. And now you can start 3.1 off this purely off of software, which is pretty cool. And if you do a soft reboot, which is control, Amiga key, Amiga key, you can and hold down some mouse buttons, you can flip it and it can request 1.3 instead, huh. which is kind of amazing. amazing. All right, the next one, which I'm not going to do, but it's made by the same man, it's Kickwork 3.1. It basically will do this for you, um, but it will go ahead and load the entire thing. It'll do 3.1 off a single floppy, kickstart and uh, workbench. It takes about five minutes. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I would rather not do that. Um, I'd rather use Twinkick and just go from here and load my own disk. And so what happens is when you see that crazy screen with the flashing, it does something similar to that for literally five minutes with no disk activity. You're almost thinking, did the machine break? What, 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 I don't even know why he did that. So I actually never used this. But then, and this one's just kind of for fun. I don't even, I'll, I'll let you guys decide what you think. This is called Kick Toss. And if you don't know what that even means, you might think it's a sporting game. Kicking, you know, tossing, or something like that. Um, Atari Toss? What's that? Atari Toss? Yeah. Yeah, the same programmer figured out a way. And this is almost, I kind of feel like, in some respects, this is like more demo scene type of stuff, where these are guys that are too smart for their own good, and they just want to see what they can do because they can do it. Uh. And that's kind of screwed up my screen a little bit, but you can sit there and twiddle things and make it fit perfectly. But now, here we go. Oh. We're looking at the uh, Atari uh. desktop <laughs> on an Amiga 1000, okay. which at the time would have been total sacrilege. <laughs> but today, I'm like, that's amazing. I love that. I think that is so cool. And look. There she is. Atari. Tells. Now he can't distribute these discs because of silliness, yeah. but he you know, can whisper here and there and say, hey, if you'd like to try that, you want to try that, you want to try that. God. I was like, you're crazy. That is amazing. Now he, he was actually like, if you're actually going to want to show this to people, I should go in there and fix those bugs. I haven't touched it in 10 years. I had a kid. I'm like, don't give me your excuses, Andre. Come on. Come on. But now, you don't have to be an Amiga fan for this one. But you have to have been around in the 90s. Mm. Does anybody know what this blue thing is? Okay, what's it called? Zip drive. Zip drive. Zip drive. These things were super popular in the 1990s uh, for the transporting of 
files from place to place. That's usually what they were for. People that needed to go to school and they had large, I was an art student at the time in Dallas and I totally depended on this thing. I had, a, so they have 100 megabytes per disc. I had stacks of discs, discs wow. like this. Because at the time we didn't have thumb drives, we didn't have flash drives. That was the way you did it. Speed-wise, it's a SCSI. And, and so this guy right here, which I mentioned earlier, that has the star drive inside it, I wrote a <coughs> really cool guy based out of Tacoma uh, named Tim Kovac, uh, and another gentleman uh, over on the East Coast named Blake Patterson, who actually has one of these things to, and he actually has his working with his original uh, 1000 and a, a mechanical drive. That's what they were for. When those things were made, the starboards were made, they only wrote about 20 drivers because there just weren't that many hardware options for them to plug them into. Well, that's, that makes it almost, almost impossible to use in today's times if you want to use that thing um, unless you happen to know the exact geometry of the disk inside this thing or whatever it is that you want to attach whether it be a flash card, or you can do all kinds of stuff with it, SCSI cards, uh, SD cards, anything. But you have to know the exact geometry. If you don't, you can seek it, you'll find it, you'll format it, and as soon as you try and use it, it'll just completely explode. It'll just, it'll just completely error out and fall apart on you. So after working for almost a month, and taking a step back for two weeks and coming back to it again, the last little demo of booting up magic for this guy. And then I have one last one. We should have somebody in here who at least knows, has seen a Phoenix, or at least heard of a Phoenix. Two people. Uh -huh. um, but this is actually right now my, like one of my happiest moments <laughs> in a long time when it comes to retro hardware geeking out stuff, which is my, my passion after work and, and after family. Because uh, it took me so long to figure out but basically, through the help of these two other gentlemen, we load Kickstart, as we normally would, and then it asks for your workbench disk. Okay? This one, yeah, I put a, put a Enterprise from Star Trek. Because um, it's for the Star Drive, right? <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, that looks cool. Um, so we load that up. When it asks for workbench, Put this guy in. It's it's a modified version of Workbench that has uh, two different files on it. And what it's going to do, move this out the way. Well, what it's going to do is it's going to it's going to kind of wake up and it's going to go seek this thing out. And it's actually going to find it. It's going to mount it, and it's going to pass all of the control over to this guy, which also has a fully installed version of Workbench on it as well. Um, with no modifications at all. And then once it's done with that process, uh, this will take over. Don't tell me you lie. Don't, 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 don't make me a liar. Yeah, okay, well, this is how it's supposed to work. This is retro hardware. So this is what's supposed to happen and what I do. It's supposed to not work. But basically what happens is it loads that guy up. And I was having problems with this before the show because this little guy right here is very dingy. Um, it'll load up, you can pop Workbench right out, and it completely runs right off of this guy as a, as a normal hard drive that's actually very fast. Um, and I've been, I've been installing all of my software to this, and this is starting to become my daily driver. I usually use an Amiga 2000, which is super fast, and I mean, it's totally expanded, it's ridiculous, it's completely maxed out as far as I'm concerned for, from a retro standpoint. Uh, but this one is just such a pleasure to use. I've actually been making this my daily recently. Um, yeah, I just wish that it worked for you because it's actually kind of amazing to see it. The last thing I'm going to do, which I'm just taking a second, is I will show you guys what it looks like if you fire up a Phoenix. The Phoenix was the motherboard replacement that I mentioned in the first talk, uh, where the entire motherboard gets replaced. Um, I have this guy from Australia named Andrew Wilson. And let's see if I can do this one. I could have done an entire hour-long talk on just the Phoenix alone. It's such an amazing, very finicky piece of hardware. Um, but basically, she allows you to do 
anything that the modern Amigas could do, and in some cases, you might argue she, she could do even more. There's a few people in Germany that have these things um, that have turned them into just ridiculous, uh, unbelievable machines of power uh, that you could virtually use as your daily machine in real life if you wanted to. So it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. Um, it took me a long time to get this to work in general. I found it from a guy in Australia. That's where these were made, as I mentioned. And uh, that's actually my hard drive light because it has an internal SCSI to SD card inside, um, which boots relatively fast. I only put a 256 megabyte SD card, it's a little micro SD, it's a little tiny one. Uh, it's, the SD card is so fantastic. I feel like it's one of the best inventions for retro computing in the last several years. You can plug it into the controller cable, it doesn't even need a power. It can get all of its power right through the SCSI controller. I've already booted up into Workbench 1.3, and, and I don't have my mouse attached to it, so this is kind of funny. Um, but basically, I've also installed a complete uh, installation of uh, OS2 on it. So you can come back here, turn it off, there's a switch, you just flip it, turn it on again, and it, it goes completely back off the same drive, and it'll load a newer operating system right there. Um, it has a bunch of other kind of funky little gadgets like that where, um, yeah, and you can see the colors are getting a little goofy. It's amazing how fast this machine is. There it is. Right. Same thing, but now I'm in OS2 land. Right. Kind of a big difference from like swapping the disks in and out, all of that kind of changing stuff over there. I don't actually do any of that. Those are more just fun experiments to do once in the night. They go, oh, that was cool, and then I get to go over here. I don't really, I don't actually do that. But you could do that, and I could imagine back in 1987, 88, there were plenty of businesses who really benefited from the original case. We wanted to save time and actually get to get to doing the work. And I've been sitting here loading stuff all day long. So yeah, that's the Phoenix. And I wish I could have shown you the zip, but she's real finicky if you don't have this exactly in the right position. So that's it. That's the different ways you can do these machines. Using the old school stuff mm. from the 80s and 90s. Thank you again, Eric. Thanks very much, guys.